Um, Professor uh, Sendilla is a central figure in the study of U.S. Latinx varieties of Spanish and English, and she's also an expert in language socialization in Latinx <coughs> families. She's a respected critic of linguistic profiling and of anti-bilingual legislation here in the U.S. Um, well, anti-bilingual education legislation, but anti-bilingual legislation sounds better, right? Um, among Professor Sandea's many publications <coughs> um, is the book, Growing Up Bilingual, Puerto Rican Children in New York, which won the book prize of the British Association of Applied Linguistics, as well as the book award of the Association of Latina and Latino Anthropologists um, of the American Anthropology an Anthropology Association. In 2016, Professor Sandeo uh, received the award uh, for public outreach and community service from the Society for Linguistic Anthropology. She calls herself, and I think has created this, this subfield of, of anthropolitical linguistics. I it, named it, other people have been doing it before <laughs> me. <laughs> well, it was named, right? So anthropolitical linguistics, the title of her talk today is Language and Migration in the USA, the Impact of National Ideologies, Intergroup Contact, and Government Policies. Welcome, Professor Smith. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, and I want to congratulate the organizers for um, the creative uh, meshing of uh, different perspectives uh, on, on these topics. And I'm eager to hear uh, from you how I can enrich my own work uh, from your perspective. I want to begin by honoring uh, Mommy and Papi, uh, who met in New York as immigrants, one from uh, Puerto Rico, my mother from Aguadilla, Puerto Rico, <laughs> and my father, Ahmed Centella, from Yucatan, um, and married in 1929. Since then, um, when they arrived, there were very few Latinos in New York, but since then there are very many other mixes like me. I am a Chica Rica uh, from this background of Mexican and Puerto Rican, um, but there are very many other people who are also um, meshes of not only Latinos, but Latinos uh, with other groups. Uh, I came across this that I wanted to share with you because this is the naturalization certificate uh, that my father uh, was given. When he was 36 years old, he had been an undocumented immigrant from Yucatan all of his life. And he was given that, this certificate. Uh, if you see that they have his color as <coughs> white and complexion as dark. And um, this is the first time I've ever shown this. I'm a little emotional about this. And this is daddy's honorable discharge from the army because they gave him his naturalization in order to draft him into World War II mm -hmm. and to send him to fight in Germany. So when they need us, then they can use you. And the interesting thing in red is that you see that under race, he is now other. He is not white or Negro, but Mexican. Uh, this issue of what race Mexicans are and Latinos are has come up and is being discussed again as a result of the questions for the 2020 census. But it's certainly part of the problem of how the United States has been dealing with the browning of its citizenry. From the blue sections of these pie charts, you see that the number of migrants from Northern and Western Europe has diminished significantly. When mommy and papi met in New York, they were small, small part uh, of the, uh, uh, because in 1929, it was much smaller than what it grew to be much later, <coughs> of the Latin American population. <coughs> and uh, the Europeans still were, North and Western Europe and Southeastern Europe, and uh, North America still was the majority. But it was in the 60s that this began to change. 
and that you see the population from Latin America growing so that and that in the 80s you see a very huge growth in the Asian population and um, uh, uh, rather uh, to 48% and the uh, blue section is very small. The blue and orange is 11%. This has very important um, repercussions because we know from looking at periods of linguistic intolerance in the United States that there are major triggers. <coughs> War, World War I, the aftermath of World War I caused um, speakers of German to be lynched, bur book burnings in the United States, and the passage of the first English-only laws in the United States. Economic recession, certainly the depression that hit my parents um, after uh, they got married in 1929, and the large influx of, and certainly the, uh, the recessions of the 80s. Um, <coughs> in which the largest number of states beca began uh, passing uh, English-only laws. And the change of racially different foreigners. This has fed popular myths uh, about immigrants regarding language, uh, especially that they are supposedly are not learning English. This is from a blog in my local paper um, that they're they should go back to the cesspool. Um, they have no intention of becoming Americans or assimilating um, or of moving ahead. These notions of progress being linked to English, of assimilation and of Americanness being linked to English. This is uh, an album I hope you will not look for, but it's actually called Speak English or Die. Um, that came out in 85, a hardcore punk group. This is the chorus. You always make us wait, you're the ones we hate. You can't communicate, speak English, or die. And in this section here, nice fucking accents. Why can't you speak like me? What's that dot on your head? Do you use it to see? Um, so you can see that it's beginning to move towards speaking about uh, other groups, not only uh, Latinos, um, in this uh, period. This long table you don't want to look and get into, but suffice it to say that what it documents is the fact that European Canadian immigrants were um, becoming fewer and fewer. The growth from Latin America and Mexico and Asia was tremendous and that uh, in 10 years, Latinos grew by more than 43%, so that in 2018, we're now 58 million, and that's not counting the undocumented <coughs> uh, 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 Latinos. The breakdown of the Latino community is, um, makes clear that the Mexican and Puerto Rican groups are the largest um, and that there are five leading groups, but that all of the other uh, Latin American nations are represented. In some cities, more than others, uh, the mix uh, sh uh, shifts from city to city. When my father was uh, in New York, uh, there were very few Mexicans. By the time he passed away, he was the founder of the Centro Mexicano de Nueva York, uh, by the time he passed away, this is my father, the elevator operator, uh, who became very active uh, and uh, community uh, activist. And then the, um, uh, by the time he died, the Mexican community in New York was uh, very, very large. Um, what we have seen is the growth of racist vitriol uh, that, uh, by 2010, 67% of the victims of hate crimes were targeted because they were Hispanic. Since then, <coughs> the growth of anti-Muslim crimes is even higher. And some quotes um, about Latinos being rats, uh, breeding, uh, uneducated, low lifes, arrogant, scumbags, and out. And the President of the United States' famous quote um, 
linking us to drugs, crime, and rape. There are three important ideological processes at work in uh, linguistic discrimination. That is the work of uh, Sugal and Judy Irvine. And they are iconicity, recursivity, and erasure. I'm just going to try to um, very quickly summarize what these are. Um, but you could see in Madeline's uh, work the use of the Statue of Liberty as an icon of Americanness. Um, and also, um, a <coughs> linguistic feature or a language can become iconic of a group. And English, therefore, not only indicates Americanness, but patriotism, being trustworthy, law abiding, moral, and the other languages, of course, non in those areas. Recursivity is thinking uh, as if you were making a batter for a chocolate mix into a, 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 a vanilla cake, and it threads through. You see it over and over and over again, so that you see these oppositions um, again and again in different areas. Um, poverty, whiteness, language, always being contrasted, one group versus the other. And the most uh, wrap up of this, uh, that what tightens this up with a, with a little bow, is erasure. Whatever contradicts the narrative that you are trying to promote about um, what is positive in the nation, you have to erase, elide, keep out of history books, and um, ignore. And that includes the fact that um, bilingual education existed in German in the 19th century. Not, uh, it's not the creation of, of uh, 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 Latinos. And by the way, I have a whole discussion about the X that I can have with you later on, but I do not use that. I use the universal you. So when talking about Latinos, we can get into that. Anyway, <laughs> you're, um, that there, there are cu poor Cubans, that there are uneducated English monolinguals, that there are African <coughs> Afro-Latinos who are uh, both, uh, who are rich, educated, bilingual. But whatever it, uh, contradicts the narrative is erased. Um, here's an example of iconicity, people who can't spell English too well, making very strong uh, statements about <laughs> English, uh, no exceptions, and um, the Ofico language. I won't tell them what that sounds like. <laughs> but English as the badge of American identity is one of the major icons. You may have remember, you may remember the Super Bowl ad from 2014. Uh, do people remember this? We don't need to play it. At any rate, um, what you have is sung in seven different languages, besides English and Spanish, in a Native American language called Keres, in Tagalog, in Hindi, in Senegalese, French, and Hebrew. This America the Beautiful uh, was part of the Super Bowl uh, uh, ads. And the reaction was widespread and violent. Uh, Coca-Cola lost uh, investors and, um, and uh, purchasers uh, and all kinds of uh, uh, common. Uh, you're in America, uh, not 3,542 different languages, for Coke, uh, etc. Um, Mexicans, terrorists, Jews, and <coughs> niggers are not American. Um, the English only propaganda is very, very powerful and is moving towards making English the <coughs> official language of the United States. At this point, it is not the official language of the government of the United States. It is um, a, the official language of 28 states, but not of the US federal government. They use iconic pictures and posters like the one that recruited soldiers for World War II, Uncle Sam, and um, change it uh, in Oklahoma when they were passing the law there and voting on it, 
um, to argue that you need not, this finger wasn't made uh, to press one in English. And we will try to see if we can play for you the iconic blonde singing um, this uh, press one for English. <laughs> Tell me what to say We have to have some titles In five languages these days Now we don't ask too much To share this land Such of liberty But if it's not too the much iconic to ask, Could you please speak English? English is my language It's the language of this land And every time it's posted here I should understand I do not live in the China Now, I'll be very clear for you, so there'll be no mistake. Yeah. Her father, not mine. Okay. <laughs> um, and you see in the lower right, um, when President Bush uh, was uh, campaigning and in a debate, um, challenged, uh, President Trump was campaigning and in a debate, uh, candidate Trump was campaigning and he, he uh, assailed uh, Jeb Bush because of having used Spanish um, during the 2016 uh, campaign. Um, so we now have 28 states with official English laws and Oklahoma was the 28th state and in committee in the, in, uh, the House is the English Language Unity Act awaiting um, uh, present uh, passing. The fact of the matter is that what is erased is the extent to which English is the language of the United States and how, uh, in fact, 80% of the U.S. speaks only English at home and the other 20% is heavily bilingual. Um, the uh, they are focused on distorting the reality by focusing on the eye-popping 20% who abandon English at home. So that kind of media portrayal of uh, the distortion of numbers is, is really extraordinary. When I ask students, for example, what percent of the U.S. do you think speaks a language other than English at home, they think, you know, depending upon what area of the country they're in, they'll say, oh, 50 percent, 60 percent, 80 percent, because of this idea that English is disappearing and nobody is speaking uh, English anymore. In fact, English proficiency of Spanish speakers is growing um, uh, by leaps and bounds so that, uh, of course, it's higher among the U.S. born, uh, but uh, this is the people who speak English very well. Now, I want to make an aside here. The U.S. Uh, the, uh, Census Bureau asks, uh, how well do you speak English? And they give you the choices of very well, well, not well, not at all. Four choices. The only one they're interested in is very well. They lump those who speak it well with those who do not speak it at all or not well. And they have been calling that group linguistically isolated. I mounted a campaign <coughs> against that and we managed to move the Census Bureau uh, on that uh, as a re after the 2010 uh, um, census. Uh, but that notion is still very prevalent, that only the people who speak very well um, uh, count. And even when you use that uh, very rigid um, category, it's a very high number. Another important theory that is uh, crucial to understanding uh, linguistic intolerance is the notion of racialization. And that is, um, when people think about certain groups, they think about them in ethnic terms. Okay, so there is 
the Irish uh, uh, St. Patrick's Day Parade, or you go to a restaurant uh, that serves X kind of food, um, or there are folk dance groups for, uh, you know, uh, German folk dance groups or other, other groups. Um, but there are groups that are racialized, not thought of in ethnic terms, but thought of in racial terms. And those people are typified as human matter out of place, <coughs> dirty, dangerous, unwilling, or unable to do their bit for the nation state. Latinos in particular, uh, Latinos are uh, racialized as non-white uh, mixed breeds and demonized as illegal uh, aliens along with other groups. Consequently, their Spanish is viewed as illegal and alien in many settings. And you see that another presidential candidate, Newt Gingrich, in an earlier election, spoke about um, against bilingual education, saying that it was important that you have immersion <coughs> in English so that people learn the language of prosperity. Again, the recursivity of prosperity and English and Spanish being uh, not prosperity, the opposite of prosperity, and the language of living in a ghetto. Um, it's very easy to make comparisons between race and language because both are social constructs. Races are social constructs and languages are social constructs. And as social constructs, they share similar components or features. There are superior varieties of races <coughs> and languages and inferior varieties of races and languages. There are inherent qualities, good inherent qualities in the superior varieties and negative inherent qualities in the inferior varieties. And the other aspect that is important is that there is this notion that you should not be mixing races or risk contamination or mixing languages or moving towards hybridity or jargon or alingualism. The latest movie about the lovings helps students understand that until the 1960s, it was illegal in the United States for a black person to marry a white person in many states because of this notion of contamination and um, of race mixing as uh, intolerable. The, the reason why talking about language in racial terms has become such a powerful way of speaking nowadays is because it's no longer cool to speak about people, at least not when the microphone is on, in racial terms. You no longer uh, get by with talking about nappy heads or thick lips or chinky eyes or any of the distorted um, racial uh, comments about color and, and skin and, and features of people. But you can make comments about the English that spe people speak or the other language that they speak as being undecipherable or loud or uh, cacophonous, et cetera, in, in, an, an interruption uh, in um, white public space, okay? And the final clincher of this is that people do not expect <coughs> you to change your race, <coughs> except for Sammy Sosa, if you've seen him lately, <laughs> but um, that won't go there. Um, Nobody knows here that Danny Husami Sosa is, imagine it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I do. I do. A baseball player who was very black and now is white. Um, so people do not expect you to change your race, but they do expect you to change your language. They expect you to change the way you talk. They expect you to change to English, and they want a particular kind of English also, uh, and will make um, judgments based on uh, that. Otherwise, you are communicating to the powers that be that you are in need of external controls. You are out of control and you need to be controlled. And those controls take legal, uh, uh, um, are manifested in legal ways so that um, the federal judge, uh, the, the, um, the toughest sheriff in America 
Arpaio um, was ruled, uh, a judge ruled that he systematically singled out Latinos in his trademark immigration patrols. We go into restaurants, we go into towns. Uh, somebody wrote him a letter that a town uh, uh, had uh, a lot of Latinos in it, and he went in and, and had immigration patrols um, picking up people um, based on uh, what they looked like, okay? Uh, and that's the man who was just pardoned by President Trump. Um, in addition, we've had mothers uh, who were in court custody cases told that they were raising their children to be maids if they continued to speak Spanish to the children, even though the children were, might also have been spoken to in English. Um, you had um, in Texas, in Mississippi, uh, with an, um, a Mexican uh, language, uh, which was diminished as a dialect, uh, in Nebraska and in many other places, this notion that um, Spanish is not a fit language in with which to raise children. Tenants in uh, parts of Northern California um, were found to be discriminated against based on the kind of English that they spoke. Uh, John Baugh, a friend of mine, um, who has a, a knack for different dialects, called um, hundreds of different uh, realtors and spoke like an African-American, um, like, uh, like the Stanford professor that he uh, you know, is uh, in his standard English, and like a Chicano, um, which he learned from all the girlfriends he had, I think, um, uh, in his uh, Chicano English version. And uh, they found that consistently the Chicano voices were charged more for rent, were told that there were no apartments available, were asked for higher um, uh, uh, down payments, etc. cetera. Um, on the job, language discrimination has been on the rise so that the EEOC, uh, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission has found uh, itself deluged with tremendous numbers of cases and that um, some of those cases, like the Whole Foods Market store in Albuquerque in 2013, found that uh, workers were speaking Spanish to each other during work hours and they were uh, suspended uh, and they brought that case. Uh, there are numbers of cases in which people are hired for speaking Spanish <coughs> and then fired for speaking Spanish. They were hired to reach out to customers, um, to uh, sell a product, and then uh, in a lumber store, in the municipal uh, court in California, in insurance companies, as telephone operators in Dallas. Um, but then when they were speaking Spanish to each other, either on breaks or during work hours, they were fired. Um, teachers um, who speak with an accent have been dismissed, or um, student instructors in colleges um, who have uh, an accent uh, from uh, foreign languages uh, that they speak at home. Even though these people have been vetted by statewide exams, by academic committees that hire them, um, they have um, uh, been removed from their job uh, uh, for uh, speaking with an accent. An, an, an anchor in Arizona was criticized because her name is Ruiz and she rolls her R's. And um, if she, I guess, is speaking about uh, a place in, uh, uh, in uh, California, she, may, she will say La Jolla instead of La Jolla, um, or uh, use uh, the appropriate Spanish pronunciations. In Lawrence, Massachusetts, the 911 operator that was found hanging up on people who called in in Spanish about dire emergencies uh, is another example of this kind of uh, repression. And the teacher who recently told um, in, uh, this is last uh, fall, um, men and women are fighting. They are not fighting for your right to speak Spanish. They are fighting for your right to speak American. Mm -hmm. Of course, now the students all have video cameras, I mean telephones with video, so they have actually videoed this, and you can see this uh, online.
Linguistic repression has not only uh, focused on Latinos, but because of the focus on the number of uh, uh, Mexican immigrants, that is a very um, uh, big focus. So you have a school bus driver pouring water on an eighth grader uh, because he's speaking Spanish, but you also have students suspended for speaking their Native American language. Uh, the man kicked off the flight for speaking Arabic. And this Minnesota woman that everybody uh, has seen, uh, I, I assume, was brutally assaulted for speaking Swahili in Applebee's. These are um, constant recognition, uh, uh, reminders of uh, linguistic repression becoming violent and an excuse for physical attacks on people. Now we can say that those are those folks who are screwy um, or they're the ultra alt-right um, or they are misguided politicians with an agenda. The fact is that as Bourdieu points out, we are all involved in this. We all have to recognize the extent to which we participate in allowing authority to continue its, um, its misrecognition of and mistreatment uh, of uh, those that it governs. And that we are complicit unless we in fact do <coughs> that. Um, that no authority governs without our complicit uh, acceptance. And that um, one of the things that I would urge us to think about is our acceptance of what I call chiquitafication of the different ways of, uh, uh, of la Latino diversity. For example, the fact that there are so many different Latino groups, that they speak different varieties of Spanish, that they have different cultural experiences and different immigrant experiences, um, experiences at home and experiences in the United States. But regarding their, um, uh, their varieties of Spanish, almost all of them are considered non-authentic and non-European. And unfortunately, within the groups, some hostile attitudes try to take over as some groups try to perform authenticity uh, for the US public and for greater Latin America by claiming they speak the right Spanish. And um, uh, the Colombians in the group know that I have written about um, the, the problems uh, that the Colombian community in the United States and some Peruvians have trying to say that don't, you know, we're not Cuban, we're not Puerto Rican, we're not Dominican, we speak the right Spanish. Um, we also, all of those groups, however, have their English skills disparaged and, um, and their bilingual skills if they engage in this uh, interactive way of speaking. Um, known as Spanglish, is considered a semilingualism and a corruption. The Royal Academy of the Spanish Language contributes to this notion of inferiority. They were very proud of including for the first time words from U.S. Spanish in their famous dictionary, which is the Bible of the Spanish language. But the definition that they put in for the word of Spanglish is deformed itself. It claims that Spanish was deforming both English and Spanish, but it is the definition that is deformed and not <coughs> the way of speaking. However, uh, this notion of deformity uh, permeates uh, the entire Spanish-speaking world with these notions of correctness and it is played out on the U.S.-Mexican border by the young people who travel between Mexico and Tijuana in the zone that I live in in the San Diego area. And I have interviewed hundreds of those young people and found that, uh, and this is from, uh, I've been, imagine when MySpace was up this is the border sign that is at every border crossing in, at the entire U.S.-Mexico border. Every major border crossing has this same <coughs> sign. And that line is actually at the point of division between the two countries. And this young lady points out, this is the sign I see every day, the line that divides lives. 
and the notion that they are divided in lives also um, comes into their notions of language because then they try to be the purists in both Spanish and English. And they see Spanglish as the language of cholos, gang types, uh, and pochos. Pochos are US born uh, Mexicans. Mochos are um, uh, chopped up people. Uh, and they're super nacos. And to be a naco is to be uncool, backward. And that is a very interesting, I call it the Mexican N-word because it comes from Totonaco, a name of an indigenous group, although it has nothing to do with indigeneity, but it is a way, it's a slur for being backward. Um, these are quotes from those young people who are trying to distance themselves from their Mexican-American counterparts and um, see them as lost they don't, uh, they're nowhere, they're in a state of limbo, uh, and that they speak Spanish, and they're all uh, chopped up, and that they are not real bilinguals because they're ruining two languages. This notion that these languages have to be kept separate, like the borders are kept separate by the walls, is very much reinforced among certain groups. Uh, and certain parts of, the, of these uh, uh, young people. About half of them endorse this old notion of pure bilingualism, that is, as if you were uh, somebody who had two, lung, two tongues, and you had two heads and two tongues, and you switched one off and then turned on the other. This is a very fake and impossible notion of bilingualism. Um, they are... Um, so they say to be bilingual is to know both languages well. That's being cultured. A true recreation of the 1955 Uriel Weinreich definition of bilingualism, uh, of a bilingual, of a real ideal bilingual, is someone who never switched in unchanged speech situations um, and with uh, the same uh, interlocutors. Um, so what we see here is something that Monica Heller found in her work in Canada with uh, the French uh, uh, bilinguals. And that is um, an elite group trying to, uh, uh, or a group trying to identify as elite by distancing itself both from the monolinguals in their uh, surroundings and from the bilinguals who um, engaged in mixing. What is valued is parallel monoling <coughs> monolingualisms, this idea of you know, two spigots, um, and to marginalize um, all of the others uh, as um, not uh, fluently bilingual. This goes against the reality of language in our communities. I love this slide because um, it's not only a comment about the bilingualism of the Mexican youth, but it also reflects African-American adoption, the adoption of an African-American B feature. Mexican parents be like, por pendejo, quien te manda, andale, do it again, uh, which means, I don't know what a good translation of pendejo is for the public, but something like, <laughs> um, for being stupid or an asshole, who, who you know, uh, told you, go ahead, do it again. Um, this kind of fluent multilingual use of two languages is part of the everyday reality of living in two worlds, participating in two worlds. It is not only done by Latinos, it is also practiced. Uh, the, it's called in, the, in some communities Chinglish when it's Chinese and English, Konglish when it's Korean and English, Gringlish when it's Greek and English. Uh, and some of you will give me some other words uh, for where it occurs in the newer communities when they are um, incorporating both of their experiences. They're not creating a third language. They can speak the native language usually and the English, but they are able to reflect their dual uh, uh, reality by uh, engaging in this back and forth discourse style. It's a way of speaking that says, I'm proud of being both and I can do both. The, um, 
I, I leave by asking you, good, I'm, I'm going to be asking you, what if we occupied language? Um, about uh, seven years ago, the people who took over Wall Street demanding uh, equality and justice for the 99% who are controlled by the 1%, the wealthiest 1%, um, that, uh, that use, that have up, uh, so that, for example, those top 1% uh, of households have uh, above $1.36 million of uh, average wage income. And um, that top percent <coughs> owns as much as the bottom 90%. Occupying language can be a critical progressive linguistic movement that also exposes how language is used as a means of social, political, and economic control, and of keeping the wealthy in power and the elite in control. By occupying language, we can expose um, that, uh, that control and the source. There has been a great outbreak of hate since Trump was elected. Ten days after his election, the Southern, Southern Poverty Law Center found eight, listed 867 incidents in the first 10 days. Crimes against Latinos have surged, I pointed out. And for every crime that is reported, some people feel that t three to 10 go unreported because people don't want to go to the uh, police uh, to expose their status. And that hate groups have spiked um, and anti-Muslim crimes have increased dramatically. I call for an anthropolitical linguistics that interrupts the recreation of linguistic and educational inequality and political and economic equality. That means valuing non-standard dialects and languages and the code switching of bilinguals competing, uh, uh, breaking down definitions of bilinguals as double monolinguals, challenging the domination, the symbolic domination of one language, one nation, and the static view of cultures, because uh, we have to understand that all of uh, rigid linguistic, cultural, and national uh, boundaries are produced by ideologies that are um, uh, and processes uh, that are not recognizing that identities change, that they are neither exclusive nor singular, and that it is possible to take direct action um, to encourage the recognition of the vitality of language and what it contributes to the United States and to fight against the oppression of differences. So we demand respect from the 1% by doing things like writing, to the Royal Academy of the Spanish Language and demanding that they change that definition of Spanglish and um, to saying you make a lot of promotion about being, you know, universal Spanish, etc., and you uh, keep uh, disrespecting and uh, dishonoring um, what our uh, language uh, differences are. So, um, and we spoke to the North American branch and said, if the, cap, if the uh, Spanish branch uh, in Spain doesn't uh, respect your, our petition, you should resign. Well, in fact, the Royal Academy did change its definition as a result of our petitions. Um, this was a very big coup. It took them a long time to change it on the internet, but uh, they did go to press in uh, 2015, 16, uh, with the new definition, which simply took out the word um, uh, deform. It's still not a complete definition. What's most annoying is that they took credit for doing this instead of, uh, although they did say uh, a lot of linguists in the United States were unhappy with the decision, but they took credit. But they continued to publish books like Speaking Well, uh, We Can Be Understood, which is diatribes against um, English terms and uh, telling uh, Spanish speakers in the United States that they don't speak Spanish. Well, now um, I'm asking for your help in my latest campaign, which is about the fact that on the day of the election of Mr. Trump, the Spanish portals on the WhiteHouse.gov page were eliminated. 
On the left, you have the portal during the Obama administration, which had Spanish links to many, many different topics. And on the right, you have the portal that says, sorry, the page you're looking for cannot be found. Some of these issues you won't be able to read, but you can see by the quantity of issues on the top that the Obama administration's whitehouse.gov page covered, including climate change, including immigrant issues, all of those things are gone from the pages in English that are in the whitehouse.gov page now under the Trump administration. They cut by half the links and they cut out all of the things that are items that they do not want to see covered. Um, it's worth looking at. The, the one of the motors behind this is a very young man um, who uh, is um, uh, responsible uh, for uh, this uh, notion, Stephen Miller, um, and who as a Santa Monica ninth grader, Santa Monica High School ninth grader, um, took out petitions against seeing Spanish signs in the hall and has been a rabid uh, uh, anti-bilingual uh, uh, advocate for the Trump administration and responsible, the, the coordinator of the anti-Muslim bans. He and Bannon are the architects of that. Uh. So we have a petition to the White House right here for you to sign so that you can add your names um, to ask for reinstallment <coughs> of reinstallation of the Spanish links to the whitehouse.gov page. And we hope that you'll consider um, signing it and maybe passing it along to other people. Um, we think that this is important because we believe that e pluribus unum means that we are really, if we're trying to be one, we have to challenge linguistic intolerance because, in fact, the American dream is not dreamt in English only. Thank you very much.